session of Riffing About Writing, where we riff about writing. And today we are woman up in with Meryl Tengestel. I'm going to say that again and again. I got it, Tengestel. First try, Tengestel. I got it. <laughs> Hello, Meryl. Welcome back. Hi. Thank you for having me back, Meryl. I love it. Yours. So welcome. I love it too. I mean, it's just a, such a great, juicy conversation. Uh, and when we get into this kind of level of writing, we're getting into, like every great autobiography and memoir, it reveals your story, but it really reveals the story of the every man or the every woman uh, or the every person, right? Like that this is, while this is very unique to you, I'm reading your story and I can relate to the things that you went through, even though my story is different, but the things you had to overcome in here. And that's really what I want to, I want to ask those things. I'm so curious to find out, like I read in your book, as an example, without giving too much of the steak away and just a little bit of the sizzle, when I was reading in your book about that, that flight to Disney, like usually when people want to be pilots, you hear these stories of like, I looked up in the sky or I read a story about the Wright brothers or Amelia Earhart and I decided from that day on I'm going to be a pilot. You have a very different story about how you wanted to be a pilot. Do you mind sharing that? <laughs> I, I did. Um, you know, my I wanted to be a pilot. I actually wanted to be an astronaut first. And I knew mm. being a pilot was one of those steps. That was one of the things that was a must do. And you know, I was excited for my first experience in an aircraft and I was really excited about it. It was going to be great. And it didn't turn out that way at all. <laughs> and um, it was a very, um, I don't want to say disheartening experience, but it was a, it was a very painful experience and uh, it was not comfortable. But, you know, there were times in life when you want this goal and you know you have to do something, you're like, well, I'm going to give it another go and see, you know, okay, this time wasn't great, but we'll see what happens again. And you just got to, it's like a kid who doesn't like broccoli, have them eat it like three more times and see if they start liking it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a apt comparison in a sense, in another sense, like, uh, what I read is that you had like extreme pain on that flight to Disney yes. or I mean that I mean I say to the Disney I, we all get that you didn't fly into Disney but but you know you're a child and you're being taken to Disney and it's like this exciting thing uh yeah. New York to LA right right so um New York to uh Florida so we went oh, to, to Florida to, Sorry. To Dis yeah okay. to Disney World and um yeah I mean it was excruciating pain on the way down so you know kids don't understand pressure and equalization and how you can do that. And actually a lot of adults don't either. Mm -hmm. So um, all, you know, to have this intense pain in your ears, this headache and everything, it was just, it was awful. So right. for me, um, it wasn't great. It wasn't great going down there. It wasn't great coming back, but for some reason um, I knew that, man, this is something I'm going to have to overcome if I want to be an astronaut. And that desire was so strong that I knew that somehow I had to get around this. So, or get through this. And I mean, even at a younger age, yes. Even at that young age, you kind of knew, like it wasn't, oh, I'm giving up. I can never do that because my ears hurt too much. No, um, no. If you want something so strongly, you know, nothing is going to thwart that that idea. I mean, I just, it, this was, I mean, I knew in my heart that going into space was something that I had to do. It was wow. something that, um, it, this was a must do, you know, growing up for me, it was like, man, this is my place in the world, or this is my place outside the world is to be in wow. space. So wow. um, that feeling was just overrode everything. And I knew that everything that I did would eventually lead up to me being in space. Uh, amazing. So, okay, there's two questions on the tip of my tongue and I have to ask them both. One of them is that you, you 
increased our curiosity. You piqued our curiosity saying kids don't understand the element of equalization and, and uh, pressure, and then many adults don't. And so the thought on everyone's mind, of course, is, oh, great one. Teach us what happens if somebody <laughs> does have ear pressure. Like, give us that tip. How, how do we alleviate that? You know, for kids, I mean, they don't, if you say, hey, hold your nose and blow both your ears, they, they don't usually understand that. But if you give them gum, yeah. or if you allow them to swallow, that helps, you know, open up those eustachian tubes and hopefully alleviate that. And that didn't happen for me. Um, you know, s- some kids are just more sensitive than others. And, that, and the same right. goes for adults or for people who are older and may, may forget. Um, but again, I, you know, at that time, even though it was, um, I, I had experienced that all the way up through, I think, through college. Wow. Um, these issues. And I said, man, I need to figure this out or this is going to this is going to be a showstopper. And do you um, think you figured it out how to uh, equalize that pressure or do you feel like you just learned to suffer through it and not notice it anymore? No, you have, I mean, you have to, um, if you don't, you won't make it through flight school because you're, you're mm-hmm. going up too high in an, in an unpressurized wow. aircraft. So um, most people, I did figure it out when I got to college and I was able to, you know, work my way through and manage and, and uh, be able to Valsalva better and, and know the right times before too much pressure builds. Because if that happens, hard, hard to overcome, the more, right. you know, it's not like a bottle of wine. It does not get better with time. So you have to... <laughs> You know, you have to alleviate it quick and often. So, um, and then when I went to flight school, there was no issue. I, so that, I love that because right there, in a sense, you gave a little tip for parents traveling with children or even adults who have this, um, the time to start doing a lot of that motion or the gum, you know, before your kids are even complaining about air pressure, give them some gum, like a huge you know, two pieces of hubba bubba that I really need to chew through. Well, the kids won't mind that you're giving them hubba bubba right. an hour before landing because they're like, I never get hubba bubba. Uh, and so they're happy about it. And uh, and they're starting to do the chewing. And especially when the pain, the pressurization would start, they're in that tacky part of the hubba bubba, right? The flavor has yes. gone, but they are, you know, they need to chew down on it. So there's no, a little I... tip tip right there for parents. Absolutely. Start ahead of time. When I took uh, we, uh, the family, we went to uh, Florida this year. As soon as we started to descent, they had candy and they were loving it. Lollipop, yeah. they're like, wow, this is great. And I'm like, yes, just <laughs> doing what you're doing. <laughs> Flight candy. Yep, that's a good association. <laughs> yes, so no issues. And so then the second obvious question that it brings up, first flight was how old to Disney? How old were you? I was about, I was about eight, seven, eight years old. So then the next obvious question is when was the second flight after that? I think that the second flight I had was in college. I um, I was playing basketball. So we were, uh, we were going from Connecticut to down by Riverside, Southern California to, uh, you know, play some games. Um, So, so. Like that is just, I mean, a lot of people I think would have it in their mind that to get to astronaut level, as you did, that you need to, you know, that you're, you fell in love with flying and sitting on your, you know, grandpappy's lap and learning how to fly. But no, you went from, I mean, it's actually very apropos, the the Wright brothers to the lunar landing to, to man landing on the moon was 66 years apart only 66 years right. between those two. And so people think that there are huge, like the progress goes sort of like this slow eventual progress. But in your case, it was like, here you are seven, eight years old, your next flight wasn't till college. And from college to adulthood became astronaut level. Yes. Like so... you went from the Wright brothers to lunar landing. <laughs> <I'm> very short. <sure. laughs> amount of time yes so yes so I mean as a kid growing up in the Bronx you know we don't have the financial means to for me to fly and and do all these things so um, it's only until college and when I leave home and I join the military is when the adventure begins I mean in the meantime you know when I'm in school what am I doing I'm 
trying to study math and science. I'm taking those pre-cal calculus courses. Um, I'm, uh, you know, in my spare time, I'm looking at aerodynamic books to try to understand concepts. So, um, you know, it's, it's like, as I said before, everything I did was in preparation or everything I did, I tried to correlate was how is this going to suit me when I make NASA? Cause it wasn't if it was just like when I go to NASA, when I do this. So playing musical instruments, great. Doing everything to me was always a stepping stone with how will this translate into what I do in the future. Uh, just like the concept of that is like, here's this little girl whose ears hurt who doesn't even have a chance to get on flights, who doesn't, I mean, there's nothing around you that says, oh yeah, being an astronaut is a possibility. And yet you're like, eyes on the prize, whatever it is that gets me there, cut away all the rest. Uh, I mean, that's really huge. It's, it, I mean, it is the stuff that people talk about, um, it's like every one of us knows exactly what we're destined to, to do. And the biggest thing that gets us off our track for that is all the other stuff that comes in between. But you knew exactly, like eyes on the prize, you knew exactly what you wanted and like just cut away all the stuff that doesn't belong there. Yeah, and, and it wasn't, and I don't want people to get this, like I was a kid, I got in trouble, I had my <laughs> shenanigans, I did... I did all those other things. Yeah. But I always knew that each step was closer to the goal. So I knew the big milestones, like go to college, um, do well in math and science, get good, good grades or get better grades, you know, be in the higher math classes. Those were the things that I knew I needed to do. So I knew I had to, if I couldn't get there, I had to work harder for that. And it did, but it didn't mean like in high school, um, for instance, my mouth one time got me kicked out of band class. So, so, I mean, I was still a kid. I still did things that my mom was not too pleased about, but, you know, again, uh, academically and when I worked was always towards what lessons can I learn and how are they translatable to what I'm going to do? But in your book, you did mention that you were inspired to become an astronaut because of the show Star Trek. Yes. And um, I know you mentioned some of the characters, but was there, a, well, first I'd like to know, where were you when you watched those Star Trek show? Like, were you in your living room? Were you in your room? Were you at someone else's house? Like, who was little Merrill watching that Star Trek show? And was so, there one episode that you can remember also? That's the second question to that. Yes. Yeah, so um, I watched Star Trek. Uh, I think by the time I was six, I had a television, a small, like, you know, seven inch screen, black and white television in my room, rabbit ears. With the turning knobs. With the turning knobs. There was no remote <laughs> control back then. You had to get right. up and actually turn the channel. It was maybe yeah. four, four channels, like. CBS, ABC, PBS, and uh, right, and the and other channels were just like static, static, totally yeah, static. Like you, you from you, remember you, you had it at yes, you turn yes. the dial you one two three, you know, up to twelve I think, and then you go back to you, and then you're just like churning to oh what's on what's on yeah, so you're yes. watching Star Trek on this little seven inch rabbit ear little TV yes. in your room mm -hmm. in in my room, so you know. Um, Star Trek would come on at a specific time and it was something, man, you know, Gene Roddenberry was incredible, the creator of Star Trek, because he made this crew, um, if I took it literally, I would have been on a, I would have been on ship's company on a boat, right? So I did fly off of boats, but I would have been part of that type of the ship's crew compliment and not be a pilot. But I mean, Gene Roddenberry was great because he had all these people, aliens, um, Asian, black, white, black, white, other, all, you know, exploring space, the final frontier. And right. um, he talked about exploration. And for me, just the unknown, what each episode would bring, like what was next, what were they going to encounter? 
to me was just incredibly fascinating. No pun intended for what Spock used to say, but I mean, I just really, I really was intrigued at the fact of they didn't know what was coming around the corner. However, all the stuff that they did in preparation, they were able to manage and work together as a group and, and persevere. I mean, Captain Kirk was, it was amazing. I mean, he would just do incredible things and have all these skill sets. So I think as a kid, part of my mindset was like, everything that I do will be part of the skill set that I have to be an astronaut. So, um, you know, Star Trek gave me that basic foundation. They went, they went to Starfleet Academy. So it's not a big jump to me to say, okay, I'm going to go to college, which would be an academy. Right. They all studied space. So it's all math related. Okay. So I need to be better in math and science than anything else. That's my focus. Um, the fact that the crew complement was very diverse. No one ever said I couldn't be an astronaut or I couldn't be a pilot. So mm. I never had that in my head. Like, well, I can't do that. No one. Yeah, you, If you can't see it, you, you can't be it. Right. So right, here you were like in the future, everyone can. Right. So it was, it, it, yeah. If, even if like Uhura was the communications officer, she was black, even if she wasn't there, because she wasn't my favorite character. I thought as the communications officer, I respected it, but I was like, who wants to deal with people talking all the time? I want to fly. You know, mm -hmm. I wanted to be the navigator. I wanted to be the person piloting the ship because that's the direction it goes. So, um, but I, I just, like they just, I, the show itself just had these little things that I just picked up on. And I said, okay, how does this translate? So, I mean, for my favorite episode, gosh, I think there was, I think there was all the Star Trek geeks out there are gonna judge me, but I think there was 77 or 78 episodes. So one of the, I mean, I used to know the titles. I could see it for a split second and I knew the title. Um, right. So, uh, man, I think a lot of my episodes, People love the trouble with tribbles, which is the tribbles, the little creatures that multiplied um, <laughs> and the Klingons, the Klingons were trying to infiltrate and do things. Um, that was an interesting one. It was fun. Um, the other one, I, I liked ones when they met creatures and they had to somehow communicate and not be perceived as a threat or dangerous or usually if they met an unknown life form it was all about learning and understanding and coming together and, and getting through so I, I i like those you know those episodes quite a bit it's amazing it's amazing you know and just listening to you talk about star trek first of all i can imagine you know a little nine-year-old meryl in her room with this uh, little black and white tv um, you're just fascinated by it. Again, no pun intended with Spock. <laughs> but I, I can just imagine the way that you're telling it. Like, I watched Star Trek as a little nine-year-old, you know, with a little black and white TV. Never, not in my room at that time, but, um, but I watched it like it was sci-fi. And somehow, what I'm hearing is that little nine-year-old Meryl watched it like it was educational. Right. Somehow it's yes. like the medium is the message. Somehow the same show translated to me as like, you know, storytelling, great storytelling. And maybe that's what I do. You know, <laughs> why I eventually ended up doing what I'm doing. But but for you, you saw it as an instructions manual. Yes, I saw it you as a I saw it as a, the guide to what you if you wanted to be in that, if you wanted to be in Starfleet Cat, or if you wanted to pilot and boldly go, you needed this criteria to do it. And, um, you know, I mean, I knew it wasn't real. It was science fiction, but right. there was nothing else out there that would say different. And I didn't know any, I didn't know any astronauts. I didn't know anyone, but it just, the show made it intuitive to me, the direction I needed to go. Incredible, incredible. I mean, it really was your guide to the galaxy. Yes. I wasn't Guy hitchhiking. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, even with that, metaphorically, you kind of were. 
you were hitchhiking on this idea that Star Trek is a possibility in, in somewhat in your lifetime. And even the, even the connection that you made that, yeah, I mean, today we don't see flight as a ship. We see Navy environment as a ship. Right. But translate that, that, you know, what really everything in, in flight, like in aviation, comes from nautical, right? We, the same rules, the same, same rules apply. So then this is kind of like the bridge between aviation and, and Navy or right? aviation and nautical. Right. It's a ship in the galaxy. Yes. And you did kind of hitchhike on a metaphorical level. You sort of went like, okay, well, if I want to get to ship, I have to start on ship here because the galaxy ship doesn't exist yet. But but let me hitchhike from here to go to go there. I, I mean, guide to the galaxy. Hitchhiker's <laughs> guide to the galaxy. I mean, metaphorically, it's, it's huge. <laughs> yes. so I, I love that. And I love the imagery of that too. Because even like little... As I said, you know, a little nine-year-old Meryl, 10-year-old Meryl, maybe 12-year-old Meryl. I mean, probably watched it for a few years after school, drop your backpack, go to your room and, and sit down and watch this show um, and start to create this plan, this guide of how you're going to get there uh, as you're growing and as you're kind of developing into the vision of, of what it is that you want. And Star Trek really was kind of like the hitchhiker, you know, you hitchhiked. Right. on that show to, to get you there. Because as you said, we didn't have uh, access, to, like there were no uh, motivational YouTube videos of people who have actually done that. Right. And people who look like this or who look like that or who, you know, this piece were the stuff. We didn't have access to that. So the only access we had is, you know, oh, Star Trek's on. Right. So yeah, exactly. I love that. I, I love that. I, I would also say that um, as as I was getting older and I was reading more, I did have um, a woman who was a teacher in an after school program. Her name was Miss Harriet that actually gave me, she liked Star Trek a lot too. So she fed into a lot of, you know, my interest in Star Trek by giving me books and letting me borrow her books um, mm -hmm. constantly. I mean, I, I probably at one point started reading a book a day. Like I would yeah. go in and I mean, reading is incredibly important, but I, at that time I just wanted to absorb as much information as much adventures that they had in Star Trek and what they did to overcome it, how they handled that. Because again, it was more like, how is this going to, what skill sets do I need to become an astronaut? And the answer is, as an astronaut, you need to be very versatile. So, you know, this was, to me, a step in the direction to understand, to read, and do all this stuff. Hey, I love that because, so now you you just weighed in on just the importance of, like, one person can make a difference. Absolutely. One person who sees the potential in the child. And that doesn't mean that, that it's a parent. I mean, it takes a village to raise a child. So the Miss Harriet of the world, how often... Are we the Miss Harriets of the world? How often do we have that potential to just see a child and hand them a book and just that act encourages the potential as if I'm seen, I am seen. You know, it's, this is a possibility. Someone believes that I can actually do that. Right, I mean, I, I like to think, um, and I was thinking about it yesterday, I was like, if if you're at a place where you feel that you're successful and you've made it, if you're not mentoring, you're wrong, period. That's just, yeah. that is, and you can, I would love anyone to argue with me because as you're moving through, you're being mentored, you should start mentoring other people. I mean, there, this is just give and take. And, yep. um, you know, I'm at that. And that's probably why, you know, I do what I do in fitness because I have access to more people and, Again, I, you know, I, I think if you're not mentoring at this, for me, if I'm not mentoring, I'm wrong at this stage. It's yeah. just selfish and the skill sets that I have and not being able to share that doesn't help anyone. It's a, it's a yeah. pretty simple act in my humble opinion. I, I, I not, not only agree with you, I will also say Einstein actually said, in order to understand something, you must be able to explain it to a six-year-old. Yes. Because when we uh, 
are engrossed in something when we're when we're in the when we're still learning it we try to teach it in the most complex way possible when we take on mentoring when we take on you know bringing the same knowledge that we have to a beginner a 6 year old explaining it to a 6 year old a beginner we start to understand it so much better because we're not overcomplicating it right and that's and that's why I'm also a huge believer in writing a book because the process of writing your book has you understand the depth of your story in such a way that having just speaking to just the people who already know your story, who are already at the level, who have already achieved the same, speaking to them, you don't actually learn the bigger lesson until you start you know, writing your book actually brings it to people who have never heard about you. And you have to tell that story to a six-year-old. Yes. And it brings you in touch with your story in such a much deeper level. Uh, so yeah, I 100% agree with you. You learn by teaching. You learn by, you, and then the cycle continues. The lessons you learn by teaching it, now you can teach those lessons. The cycle continues. The, the people who, the six-year-olds who have learned from you then are able, like you will be in someone's story, you will be the Miss Harriet. Yes, uh, it would, it'd be great to, it's, it's almost like passing on that DNA. So yep. it's kind of, um, I wouldn't mind that. I mean, you know, people talk about legacies and stuff. To me, it's just, you know, passing on that knowledge and having that continue as long as it's good. And, and uh, I mean, even when I was a flight instructor, to me, it was like passing on my way of flying. And right. it was great to see some of my students who, not only did well, but they came back and they were commanders and they were leading. And I got to see that as a colonel and watching these guys lead. And I was just like, oh, makes me so proud. Uh, 100%. And that's, you know, I just, that can happen at any time, just for everyone. Uh, and I, there's a question I want to ask you about that part about flight instruction, but I just want to interject here and bring in you know, there's a great story about Alfred Noble, and you may know this story, but I'll just share it here because I really want everyone to know you can change or you may have a legacy that leads one way. And at any given time, your legacy can pivot and become something so much bigger. Uh, on the topic of legacy, one morning, uh, Alfred no Nobel or Nobel, people pronounce it, uh, from the fame of the Nobel Literature Prize, Peace Prize, uh, mathematics and science um he woke up one morning to open up the newspaper and find a an editorial announcing erroneously and mistakenly obviously because he's reading the paper that he had died hmm. so he's picking up this paper and he's reading alfred nobel has you know this we're sad to announce that alfred nobel has died Alfred Nobel's claim to fame at that point is that he was one of the early inventors of TNT, of like this highly volatile explosive. And, you know, as Alfred Nobel read this and realizing like, wait a minute, I've just been given the gift of knowing what people will say about me after I die. And the only thing that's being attributed to me is that singular accomplishment of inventing TNT, which I don't want associated with my name. Uh, while that's a beautiful, I mean, a, a huge, account, beautiful, I can't say it's beautiful, but I mean to say, I mean, it's, it's of note. He right. achieved something that would have him be in the newspaper as an inventor of something, but that was not the legacy he wanted. And so in his later stages of life, he developed the, uh, what we now know as the uh, prizes, as the Nobel Prizes, and the whole establishment and how those are chosen. And, and, uh, and now, do we even know that Nobel invented TNT? No. Or do we know the Nobel Prize? The Nobel Prize. Because it's in the passing it on, the passing on of the legacy that we associate that. So uh, I just love that on the on the topic of this passing on legacy, I just wanted to bring that in because this is ultimately at the end of our lives, what do we want to be remembered for? 
Yes. And, and so that's what you're building. Now, you mentioned, though, that you were a flight instructor, and I know you started in the Navy, and it just begs the question, how long was your military career? Uh, my military career was 23 years, four months, 20 days between the Navy and Air Force. Wow. Yes. I mean, that's a lifetime. That is a lifetime. It's, uh, yeah, it's almost half my life. And so how long were you in the Navy? I was in the Navy for about almost 10 years, so a little under 10 years. So I, Okay. Yes. So, um, and then I switched over to the Air Force, maybe a little over. Then I switched over to the Air Force in 2004 uh, when okay. I got picked up for the U2 program. Wow. Wow. And then, and then we can't say smooth sailing because you shattered the sky quite a few times and that uh, in the Air Force as well. Yeah. Uh, but let's go back a little bit. What were some of the things that your what were your accomplishments in those 10 years in the Navy? I know that you were a helicopter pilot, but there were a few other things that happened in right. the Navy. So, I mean, I started out as a helicopter pilot, um, flying H-60 Bravos, which was a great aircraft off uh, East Coast. Um, I, I was on three ships at the time, Normandy, McInerney, uh, Spruins, which are no longer in service. Then I got picked up as a, one of four Navy instructors for the new established T-6 uh, they were establishing the T-6 program. The Air Force wanted uh, some Navy instructors to go teach with them at Moody Air Force Base. And I was one of four selected to go out there as a, as a lieutenant to instruct. So um, after my T-34 training, I went out to San Antonio, learned to fly the T-6. We did some uh, courseware testing and then went out to Moody Air Force Base for three years which was a wow. good time. Got to instruct Navy and uh, Air Force students. So it was a, it was a very good experience. It was, it was something that I was interested in. I wanted to know how other branches of service work because I was just interested in how the sister services work. So working with the Air Force for three years was, uh, it was a good, good experience. I mean, good enough that I switched over. So That's what I was going to say. It was a, probably a great bridge that, that came in and back to the whole uh, concept of that curiosity for anyone who hasn't watched the uh, portion of this riffing about writing about you growing up in the Bronx, where we talked a lot about you being a very curious girl. So here is a great example, you being a very curious woman in yes. your early career in the Navy and this bridge to the Air Force. So that uh, catalyzed you going into the Air Force. And then yes. what were your some, some of the things that you did uh, through the Air Force experience? So through the Air Force experience, um, when I came into the YouTube, when I soloed in the U2 um, and subsequently finished my mission check ride and did my first mission, you know, I was the first, first and only black woman to fly the U2. So to put that in perspective, in the 66 year history of the U2, there's been 10 women that have been qualified to fly. I think we wow. just, I think the 10th woman just soloed a couple of months ago. Um, of you two pilots, there's probably around 1,100 in the history of the 66 years. I'm the only, the first and only black woman. And of black pilots, there may also just be a handful, about 10. So wow. it's a very small, of a small group. And, um, you know, 66 years later, we're flying this aircraft that, this high altitude. Most people don't still believe that we're flying it. And um, it was a great... What is the altitude? Um, For us uh, aviation freaks. And yeah, geeks. Un unclass um, above 70,000. So so that's why you have to wear the pressure suit. Um, it's a single seat aircraft, which is unique in itself. And the U-2 is one of the more challenging aircraft to land because of the bicycle uh, gear configuration as opposed to tricycle landing gear. That's why in the YouTube program we have an interview process because flying the aircraft is not intuitive to some people and it's uncomfortable. You put the suit on on top of that, it makes it very challenging sometimes, especially if you're flying long missions and you come back and you're tired. And now you have to land this, basically stall this aircraft at two feet to actually land it. 
because um, in line in line vice like we're talking about two wheels in line yes two wheels in line so one's in main yeah the so main gear you, you can't have any variability in your in your like, weight on the wings like the center of ballot center of gravity yes. on the wing so yeah. you you stall this aircraft no drift so you can't go right left, right no crab so the nose has to be straight um, your visibility, especially with the suit on, is very limited. So you have someone in the back giving you altitude calls. Um, so that's why it's not for everyone. I mean, some people mm -hmm. come to the interview, they do one flight and they're like, no, nah, I'm done. This is not for me. <laughs> or some people do the claustro we do a claustrophobic test. They get in the suit and they go, no, no way. This is not for me. So wow. it, it's not for it's definitely not for everyone. Um, physiologically, it's it's a lot on you on a daily basis. So we only fly, when I was flying, it was once every third day because of how tired you became, the 100% oxygen, the altitude, everything, the, the, right. the duration. So uh, it's this aircraft is not for the faint of heart. So. And, and yet, on a larger scale, here was the Navy being a bridge to the Air Force just because of the latter part of your career at the Navy. And now here again, I can also see how the U-2 and all of the constraints coming in with getting used to the pressurization and the claustrophobia and all of that is actually a very uh, accommodating bridge to the, to the astronaut program. Yes. So for me, the U-2, um, the mission set that the U-2 did was, it, to me, it, it was very similar to what the H-60, some parts of the H-60 mission did. Don't get me wrong, helicopters are low, slow, but we did, we did reconnaissance. We did communications relay. We did, every morning we did something. Every day when we flew the, the H-60, it was something different. You had to be ready. Your skill set had to be on point. For the U-2, um, it was it was similar. You know, the recce part, the mission is not, I, I think back in the 1960s, the mission was you flew a, a specific route, but nowadays, especially when the, you know, Operation Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom went off, it was a very dynamic environment. So you can plan for something, but in the drop of a hat, you could be taken off station and go somewhere else. So you had to just be ready. You had to understand your sensors. Again, you had to just be very versatile. Um, it's, you know, it's like exploring the mazes or, or doing an adventure. You have to be ready and you have to rely on your experience, your wits, things that happen in Star Trek every day to overcome different <laughs> scenarios that are unknown. So it's yeah. in a sense, I, I like stuff like that. I like to challenge myself and see how well I could do. It, I love the reference back to Star Trek because it really is the guide to the galaxy. I mean, you're, you're, all the lessons learned there were lessons employed here. And so just with that, the last question I just want to uh, say, because yeah, you achieved astronaut status. I mean, you really had a guide to the galaxy. And I'm going to put a picture in here so that people can see the cover of your book. And that's really a just an incredible picture, an incredible image. But I really wanted to ask you, I know that that picture hangs in the Pentagon. How yes. did that happen? What does that picture mean to you? And how did, what does it represent to you for it hanging in the Pentagon? Uh, I was, when I retired, a couple of months later, I was approached by someone at the Pentagon who reached out to me and, and they said, Hey, we would like to, um, we're doing, you know, women first or something in the Air Force. And we'd like to have your picture as part of that collection. And I was shocked a little, I, I was shocked because, you know, I'm retired and, and it, it was just very, you know, I was very honored and, and humbled to know that someone, you know, they wanted to put me amongst these women that were there. And so they, they hired an artist who came out uh, to Beale, and basically this, uh, his name is Chris Hopkins, a phenomenal oil painter. 
And um, we went out, we talked on the phone first, came out to Beale. They, um, they set it up so I could take some pictures by the aircraft and the, in the pressure suit. And he drew, I mean, he painted a spectacular uh, piece that really captured, I was surprised. I mean, I, well, I was surprised, I was blown away. Um, that captured who I was in essence. And um, it's hanging in the Pentagon. I'm not sure where it's at. I'm gonna find out because I would love to go there uh, later, maybe a, a year from now when this COVID thing starts to hopefully die down and, and get right. a tour and take a picture with my picture. <laughs> I would love to see that. That would be exciting. And the irony of it is that you have a picture hanging with an in the Pentagon that you can't even access to go take a picture with your picture, but time will time will bring that. And for anyone else who watches this, if by the time they're watching this, if by the time uh, you know any this video is out, the Pentagon is available to have people go into the they can actually go to find your picture yes. uh, and in fact, hold your book with the picture in front of the picture. I, I tell you what, the first person I see do that, I'll send them a Dragon Lady t-shirt. Easy. Oh, you heard it here <laughs> first, ladies and gentlemen. You heard it here first. It, and I'm sure I'm sure if anybody else does that, uh, whether they're first or not, they'll get a, you know, I'm sure you'll, if they reach out to you, you'll get them a Dragon Lady t-shirt. And I love that little thread there. I love that you added that in because the that was the last part of this session, this interview, but 100% it is a great foreshadowing to go back to the video around what it is that you're doing now currently in your retirement, which I put in air quotes for anyone who's not watching and just listening. I say retirement because I don't think this lady has ever known or will ever know what it is to be retired. You found a next mission, a new pursuit. Yes. Uh, and that is in training people to be the strongest you know the strongest version of themselves yes uh mentally physically um you know just willed and uh and that is you know the dragon lady is is the persona that's coming <laughs> with that and if to, to find out more about that and that whole story and and an element about the tv show tough as nails uh there's actually going to be let's say right here or right here, I don't know, on the video of, you know, just click on that to watch that uh, episode and find out about the Dragon Lady. But with that, thank you so much for that promise. And you heard it here. If you go to the Pentagon with a picture of the book, and now will you, is it okay if they have it on their, on their phone, the cover of the book or on their, you know, Kindle reader or something like that? Or is it a print book? Will you, I will, I will take, I will, I will take Kindle reader or print book. Um, or phone, any, any, any image. Yeah. Any okay. image, any, any image. image, the first person. First person, first group. You know what I would love to see for you? Here's what I would love to see. Back to the leaving a legacy, the Nobel prize. I'm gonna up it. I, I would just love to see. Now, I can't promise anyone a, a Dragon Lady shirt. Maybe I would promise them a right on hat. I don't know. But I would love to see for you the first parent, mother or father, bringing their child to the Pentagon because their child is dreaming about becoming an astronaut. And in order, you know, sort of like that Miss Harriet or the Nobel, in order for that child to know that they can do it, the parent or the, or the, you know, the elder takes that child to the Pentagon to show a picture and go, if she can do it, you can do it. Absolutely. And that picture will become their Star Trek. I like it. I like it. All right. Let's put that out there. Let's get that. So that's a call out. Anyone who takes a picture at the Pentagon or anyone who takes their child to take a picture at the Pentagon. Yes. Because if you can see it, you can be it. And with that, 
Uh, thank you so much for this episode about uh, of riffing about writing. As I said, we're going to put the link in for the next video here. It okay. might be here. It depends where it shows up <laughs> on YouTube, but that's okay. Uh, to find out more about the Tough as Nails experience and the TV show Tough as Nails that you were on. And to find out more about your book, All Shatter right. the Sky. Thank you for that. Thank we're you. here with Meryl Tengustal, and this is Riffing About Writing. See you next time. <laughs>